Okay, so yeah, my name is uh, Karis O'Connell uh, from Meta, uh, the one with the amazing booth outside. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about designing for spatial reality. Uh, I must apologize, this is going to be very, very uh, design-centric, but I think developers will get a lot of value. There won't be code examples to walk away with, but I think there'll be a lot of learning uh, uh, that people can take away from this. So let's get started, because I hope I can cram it into 20 minutes. Okay. So um, prior to Meta, uh, a little bit by my background, it may give you a little bit of a kind of context around my viewpoint on AR. So um, I've worked at a bunch of different companies in my career uh, the last 18 years. And uh, I've worked at Apple and Samsung and uh, uh, no notably Nokia for the longest period. And so because of that, I've had a lot of experience in the uh, consumer electronics side and building productive software. So I've not come from a gaming background. I never entered into this space from an entertainment point of view. It was always looking at this on how can this transcend what we have right now? What is the next generation of, uh, of, of computing? So uh, yeah, as you can see, there's a few different little shots there from different types of technology that I've worked on. So hopefully this works. There you go. Oh, it keeps jumping ahead, like two slides, so we'll have to roll with it. Okay, so before that, you saw a glimpse. I also released a book uh, in 2016 for O'Reilly Media called Designing for Mixed Reality, and uh, that was interesting at the time because when I wrote the book, they said to me at O'Reilly, could you please refer to other books in your book? And I said, there are no other books, and then they didn't know what to do. And they were like, well, well what is the reference point? And I was like, it's the Wild West. This is like how it is back then. So. Um, you can download it from O'Reilly for free. There'll be a link at the end. So um, I often show this because uh, um, people in the, in the AR space and the VR space in particular often think of it as something fun. You know, there's a many, many experiences out there, uh, especially here at AWE, which are incredibly fun to use. And um, what I always say is, you know, I like fun. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I like fun and I like games. But I'm really more, um, let's see if I can uh, jump one slide. Come on. No, it jumped two slides again. OK, so uh, jump, that's it. So I'm more like this guy, um, trying to multitask and get on with the kind of eight or nine hours of your day that you are supposed to not be having fun. You're supposed to be productive, and you're supposed to be uh, making things happen and uh, potentially changing the world with what you're doing. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's been my focus for the last uh, I'm going to say five or six years in this space. So, oh, go back one more. It keeps jumping to two slides with each tap. So we're really here to talk about frameworks. I think this is really what I'm going to be focusing on here um, and what it means to have frameworks. Because, you know, once upon a time, uh, there were no frameworks. Um, and before frameworks, it, the world looks a little bit different in, uh, in, in technological terms. So if I try... One slide, yeah. Um, so this is mo the mobile phone era predating the iPhone. Um, we had different types of operating systems, different types of interactions, different types of behaviors. And from a developer perspective, uh, in those days, it was really difficult to traverse between these things because they all worked completely differently, not just from a code perspective, whether it be Symbian or it be Palmos, which was web-based but also from the interaction and the design of the application themselves. So often developers had to pick a singular path. You know, they would become a Symbian developer um, or they would become a Palm developer and so on and so forth. But again, there wasn't really a lot of knowledge on the kind of commonality of behaviors that would, that would occur at that time. And so it didn't really take off as we know uh, until the iPhone arrived. Um, conversely, with the web, so this is a website from 1999. Um, this is uh, GeoCities. I don't know if anybody is old enough here to remember GeoCities. The good old days of the web. <laughs> there you go, John. Um, but this is what it was like. This was before anybody looked at user behavior or looked at uh, user experience design or interaction design. And literally, people were coding things and throwing things up literally on top of each other and making them blink for attention or, you know, those kind of animated GIFs that have like fire on them and stuff like this to get your attention. And this was, uh, 
I think your VATS page. Yeah, that's right, it's a VATS page. So uh, this was what it was like. And again, this was before frameworks. And uh, obviously over time, what happened was people realized, yeah, it turns out it's not really easy to use. And once you go from one side website to another, there's some time needed to try to even understand where to start from, where to go to. So this was something that uh, uh, was uh, solved. Uh, here's an example. So I mean, now, you know, if you're building a website where it's designed to convey information, productive information to the users, you normally can start with many different types of uh, frameworks. This is an example from, I think, Zub. Uh, there are so many of these now that most web designers literally are just, they grab these things and they explain to you how they work and you construct this, like Lego bricks, if you will, um, and then you add in your content, right? And you know what a drop down is and when you see a header, you know how it's supposed to behave, you know what a carousel is and so on and so forth. So, in many ways, this is, is a solved problem on the web, and this is, you could argue, has, has created the proliferation of the economy on the web as well through SaaS software and things like, like that. Same goes with, uh, let's see if I can do this, quick tap, yes, uh, with iOS. So, I mean, again, if you're, if you're doing mobile development now, you uh, download Xcode, um, and you can use Interface Builder, and they have draggable elements called menu bars, and they have elements called canvases and navigation elements. And what it means is that if, you're, if the job of your application is to convey information, and it's not for entertainment purposes, there's no point in trying to rewrite the rules on interaction and behaviors, because a lot of study has gone into this over the years to work out what is the easiest way to get this information across. And of course, it's exactly the same with Android as well. So uh, you know, Android offers the same thing, and now you've got cross-platform uh, builders like Xamarin, which will allow you to build a singular interface and deploy widely to multiple devices. What that means is that you can control the experience a little bit better, but it also means that if somebody is trying your application out on iOS or on Android, they don't need to rethink everything again. If you have a to-do app that's over here, or you have a to-do app that's over there, it's not like, how do I use these to-do apps all the time? So when you go into our area of technology, what you'll see and what you see a lot of is a lot of kind of carryover from what we've had and what we have right now. And so, you know, if you look at this, this is, I think, from the Samsung Gear. Uh, it's a common type of layout, which is panel-based, and there's lots of panels floating in, in mid-air, right? And these are lifted literally from mobile and arguably web frameworks. And so, while this is kind of an easy step to get this stuff kind of on your face, we actually at Meta are looking at something a little bit more profound and a little bit more uh, to try to transcend what has been there before. And so, um, you know, uh, we're looking for more physicality in particular. You know, we've, uh, we realize that a lot of these experiences that are available today are somewhat discombobulated they're literally, like I said, taking these squares and these, these rectangles and just putting them here and there and all over the place. But we, we've observed that the, you know, people don't necessarily get enthused by this. It feels familiar, which you could argue is maybe why AR hasn't achieved that rocket launch that people thought a few years ago, because it isn't yet profound enough to switch from what you had before. It's just a little bit more of the same just a little bit more discombobulated. And so what we've been trying to do is, is try to really look at how can we truly change the way you use computing. So, uh, okay, good. So uh, last year we launched uh, our workspace. I think we won best of show here uh, actually last year with this uh, when our CEO Marone showed this off on the, on the stage. And uh, we launched this and people were using this and feeding back what they thought about this and what they thought about us. And we were very open to lots of incoming remarks and feedback and criticism. You know, we were, we, this was the first time we'd put something out there. And uh, the workspace was a kind of our starting block for what were we gonna do next. So when we think about the physicality and we take that into consideration, we had to look at this and say, what is this really informing the user? You know, or what kind of uh, physics systems are we gonna use in AR that makes it more than just things floating in space, right? So um, 
we spent an incredible amount of time talking with developers and our third party community and also with you know, our own internal teams of neuroscience and design. We sat down and we had to do a lot of like, hard looks inwards as well and realize we have to really learn from this and we have to keep questioning what we're doing and pushing it forward. And so um, you know, with that, uh, let's see, we wanted to uh, come up with some key principles with whatever we were gonna try and uh, move forward with from what we had last year. And the first one was really to minimize potential risks. And what I mean by that is design risk. So um, we, we observed that a lot of the development companies out there that we speak with are primarily staffed by Unity developers or OpenVR developers. Th there's no interaction designers working in there. There's no UX designers. These are a lot of people who've come quite naturally because of the medium from gaming. And quite naturally, they come in and they see it as a wild west and they just go forth and they build something and they kind of hope for the best. And so we wanted to come up with something that maybe would help ground them and give them a chance to have some starting blocks. So, you know, the, the next thing was uh, uh, creating commonalities. So we, we, we sat down and we went through uh, brainstorming, you know, in the very classic fashion of whiteboards and multiple whiteboards and many different types of sketches on what can we do here? What should we try to uh, put down as, a, as, a, as an approach that may be useful for developers? Um, and so we started looking at this and looking at how could we make common interactions and common behaviors so that developers don't have to write everything from scratch. So when they do want to do something as simple as, I need to open a file, everybody doesn't have to go away and invent their own opening a file system before, when that's not really what they're doing with their application, what they're doing with the experience. They should be concentrating on that part, you know, in exactly the same way as an interface builder would do for a developer on iOS. It's like you own the things that go into it and you decide how you want to use this. But fundamentally, you know, we just wanted to offer this uh, uh, opportunity. So we started to come together with, uh, which you'll see in the, the, our, our booth um, uh, over in the, uh, in the expo. Uh, we started to come with these common types of uh, components. And uh, we sat down and we looked at, well, what's the common situation that our user base is using the meta device? And of course, it's a tethered headset. There's nothing secret about that. So we're not going to be walking across the stage. We're not going to be going over here or going over there. We're relatively going to be seated in a certain area, whether it be at a desk or standing at a standing desk, right? So we wanted to think about, well, how does AR translate to the stationary experience? Does it suddenly have no value, or do you have to always be moving around? And so a lot of this came from how do we enforce the concept of the surface? And so we came up with some of these ideas from this, where we have uh, what we call uh, uh, the plate, and we have pads and we have pods. Sorry, everything starts with a P, but that was just coincident. But we started to try to chop up the environment and delegate what space means. And so uh, through multiple iterations, um, we got to what, what you'll see right now uh, with the meta viewer and uh, also with, um, with the Mapbox application that we have over there. And we work with a lot of other third party partners. So, okay. Reduce development effort. So, I mean, another big key part of this was that uh, it's no good just telling people what to do. It's no good us just going, well, you should probably do this. We should probably do that. Because we know that time is money for a lot of the developers here. We know there's not a huge amount of uh, revenue stream yet in AR. So we're trying to minimize that uh, development effort as much as we can contribute to. We're trying to allow people to have some building blocks so, again, they don't need to worry so much about that. They just can concentrate on the experiences that they want to build on top of that. Okay. Oh, yes. So, you know, this is your typical kind of open unity, uh, and this is what you see. And this is obviously, you know, in metaphorically, this is kind of how it was, has been working, even for our own developers. You know, you would download the SDK from us, and it would, it would have all the components needed to get it working on our system with the slam and the hands and everything else. But fundamentally, you, you know, it was like, there you go, right, go for it. We don't know what you're going to do. Um, and so we wanted to offer something a little bit more than that. So 
uh, we are now offer this uh, Unity package, or we're going to be soon offering this Unity package, um, which provides all of the components that, you, that, that we were describing. And it comes with a set of guidelines on how best to use them and how they might work for these kinds of use cases, but not for these kinds of use cases. Now, you know, to be clear, we're not dictating that everything must exist like this. We're offering these things as starting blocks. We've had developers who've built on top of this, and they may, for example, much like Zero Light, they may have a car that's available, uh, and they can pull them out of the pod and put them in front of you, and you can sit at a desk and move this around and interact with this and apply behaviors and, and actions but you can also pick this thing up and move it away from the pad, and it still works, and it, you can have it full-size scale, et cetera. So we're not trying to limit this in any way. It's just to, to, to help with uh, what we can do to minimize that risk. And the other bigger, bigger idea here, which I think touches everybody here, is to lower the bar to adoption in, uh, of AR, right? Because um, one of the observations we've had is that you know, with the workforce, um, they tend to be risk-averse, unsurprisingly. And what that means is that they don't want to pick up a platform where they have to spend a long time training individual use cases and individual interactions for every type of thing. So it's either used as a niche right now, AR, so it's a, for a specific use case, and you buy a device and it does that one thing, but nobody's thinking about, well, what if everything was happening inside of AR? What if my general computing was done in AR? How would I move between these things, right? So if you think about how things are built right now, they are kind of uh, singular and unique and often entertaining. You know, if you, if, like I said, if you go around the floor, you can try many, many demos, and they're all disconnected from each other. It's very hard to see those common patterns. Of course, if you start having many of these applications, then you kind of amplify the disconnection. So, so as you move between each one, you've got to learn again. So you go from one thing from a vendor, and then you go to another thing from another vendor, and you have to relearn the control layouts. You have to understand how it's going to work. What does their kind of uh, metaphors mean? What do the, does their kind of symbology mean? And so, of course, what that means for the adoption uh, from a general purpose computing point of view is that um, you end up with needing time. And that, those blocks of time between transitioning from one experience to another experience, that time to readjust and recalibrate, that adds up, right? So it's very hard to do that. Of course, we're used to desktop machines where everything has a menu bar on a desktop machine. You understand how to open files the same, no matter what the application is. So when building practical solutions, we're often uh, looking to increase the efficiency. We're not trying to match what we can do in reality, right? We're not necessarily bounding ourselves by this. We're trying to make you essentially superhuman with this to create a, a continual sense of flow between one task to another task. And so that's kind of where the meta viewer came from, actually, was just from this sort of philosophical uh, um, groundwork and our, our, our philosophy around spatial interface and also with a deep, deep infusion of neuroscience, all of this fed into what, we, what you see out there uh, in our booth. And uh, you know, we, now you start to see the real kind of examples of this working, and we've worked with third parties, and they use these tools productively in their offices for their use cases. So we're starting to see that adoption. And so um, as we go forward, this will evolve. We're not saying that we're done. This is no, by any means saying we've solved the problem. But what we're trying to do is try to solve the problem that AR has, which is discombobulation, and trying to make some coherency and commonality across this. Even if you're a third party like Mapbox, right? You know, we took this upon ourselves to think about how would mapping work using components using these things and working with Mapbox, and, and it works, and it's incredible experience. And so we know that these things can work on multiple levels, but once again, we're not saying that it should be the be-all and end-all of everything. And so to, to end this, really, I mean, the way we look at AR is that it's actually more of a design challenge. It is, and it's arguably a societal question of, do we want to move to this than a technological problem? 
and that's increasingly so, so as SLAM and other technologies get worked out, you won't be able to blame the technology anymore. It will simply be nobody's thought about this yet. And so we're really passionate about this. And so um, I want to thank you for this talk. Thank you very much. It's lunch. You can get lunch now. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, questions. Nobody leave. Questions. <laughs> yeah. So anybody? Questions? Wow. Oh, hold on. I see. Yes. So you're asking what kind of user testing we do? User research. So, yeah, so good question. Um, yes, we do. We do user testing. So we do different forms of user testing. Um, some of it is more, let's say, uh, higher level, which is more around do you understand the interactions that you're seeing? Is the task, does the task flow make sense to you? And then we have another layer of testing, which is more neuroscience-based, which is looking more at the human performance side of things. And this is the deeper kind of perception questions, right? So we have to deal with things like depth of field issues, where is it placed in the world? We deal with interaction issues, and we deal then with kind of how do you perceive what you see uh, issues. So we have a, a, a lab at Meta, and you know we will put people uh, I, well, sorry, that's the wrong word, put, not put people, but people will be in rooms and we will observe their behaviors. So we have a, 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 very, a very good uh, approach to this. And of course, you know, this is not by any means um, uh, a finished process. We are continuously, continuously learning and ready to uh, rethink things where needed uh, the whole time. So anybody else? Yes, sir. So the question was, or, or rather your comment actually, was our tracking was bad. Have you seen the, the newest version of the SDK? Two, you should try 2.7. So I, I, I urge you to go and check out the newest demo with the tracking. We've made a very large leaps ahead. This is a, an intense area of focus for us as Meta. And we know that the, you, you, there's no point in spending all the time making eloquent looking interface if if it faces if everything's jiggling around and not locked to the world. So we understand that implicitly, and we're spending a lot of effort trying to get this locked to the world. We're working on a lot of things internally on surface plane detection and stuff, and I think what you're gonna see over the next coming, you know, very short amount of months is a huge leap forward in this. So it's, it goes hand in hand. You can't do one without the other. So, yeah, we've considered outside in, and I think that the issue has been uh, set up friction, because I think that uh, what we've discovered is that while maybe early adopters like yourself and maybe others in the room quite happy to wire up their house or wire up their office, it doesn't scale very well uh, to wider use cases. And especially when we speak to businesses, they don't want to wire up their office. So, you know, we're trying to keep it inside out, and uh, like I said, you will see a massive difference with the newest SDK. So, okay, anybody else? Is that it for questions? I can't see over there, anyone? Okay, thank you everyone. You can all go for lunch now. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>